Geek Therapy Radio. Welcome to Geek Therapy Radio. I am your mental curator, Johnny Hamburger. What a year 2019 has been. I hope it was a good year for you. I hope 2020 is even better. If 2019 wasn't the best year for you, you know what? 2020 is the time. It's a new year to turn it all around. And just know that you're not alone. I know that 2019 may not have been good for at least some of you. Just know that you're not alone. We're all geeks about something. We're all here with you. Uh, This is a supportive community. And just know that I uh, love you. I can speak for myself. And just know that I love you. Thank you for listening to Geek Therapy Radio for another year, 2019. Uh, This episode is going to be a look back at Geek Therapy Radio in 2019, kind of some highlights from past guests I've had on the show, and we're going to start off tonight with an author, Kate Howells. She she was the author of a book called Space is Cool as F.U., and it was a very fascinating discussion, so here is... What I thought was the most poignant part of our discussion, I mean, it, it's up to debate, but this is what I thought was the was the best takeaway from that discussion. So let's go back and listen. When some people look up in the sky, they might feel alone. I'm just a little speck of dust that doesn't matter. I think yeah. I think a different way. I'm I'm honored to be a part of this universe. I am a speck of dust here, and what is my purpose here? Like I, I'm here, part of this. I'm molecules that coagulated into something that is supposed to serve a purpose. So I think people getting sparked through your book or otherwise, it, it, what I'm trying to get across to listeners here is is do it. Look up and do it, and get into science of some sort because you learn a whole lot about yourself. Uh, quick, yeah. Kate. Do you have any input on that? I was going to ask another question oh, after that. Yeah, no, totally. I would love to comment on that. Um, I've always felt that my own understanding of science and nature, and especially once you kind of go off planet and start learning about space, it's always had a sort of spiritual feeling to me where, you know, the sort of the, the glory of creation, even mm-hmm. if you don't believe in a creator, even right. if it's just, you know, the spontaneous creation of the universe or however you think it came about, right. I mean, appreciating what is out there and what's possible and what phenomena like occur. And some of them are gorgeous and some of them are crazy. And I mean, yeah, to me, that's always been spiritual. And yeah. like, I, I feel almost like an evangelist where I want to, you know, convert people to this right. and show them, you know, show them what I've experienced. It, it, is, it does definitely have a lot of parallels to sort of religious experiences and people wanting to like preach, you know, there's, I, someday I'd love to set up, you know, a church of space and have a weekly sermon about some cosmic phenomenon yeah. and, you know, how you can think about it and how that might make you feel about your own existence and that kind of thing. That's, that's such an awesome idea to, to let people behind the curtain here. I, I myself, I am a Christian. I identify as a Christian, but I all, there's no but. I'm not making excuses for it. Yeah. But I can look at the stars, and it takes it takes none of the wonder, of the mystery, of the science out of it. Just that my personal religious belief has no effect on mm-hmm. the the wonders that I see out in space, and wondering about stars and how they're formed, and the hydrogen hydrogen uh, operations, and, and nuclear fission, and all that kind of stuff. It just makes it I'm like, man, if if there is an architect that I, I want to talk to this person, oh, yeah. because like I I want to see all the blueprints here, and this yeah. is, this is really neat to me. So yeah, and, there's definitely no um, sort of contradiction necessarily between religious belief and um, an appreciation of science. I mean, the history of astronomy is so tied up with the history of religion as well. I mean, yes. these things have gone hand in hand for so long, and it seems like there's but there's become a sort of division between science and religion in right. recent recent history but it's nonsense i mean it's exactly not it doesn't have to be i think that's one of the biggest kind of lies we've been fed is that the two are polar opposite you know it's possible yeah. i i draw the analogy it's possible to go to church on sunday and then the lab on monday I just thought it was an interesting concept that sometimes I think we all too often forget that you don't have to compromise your soul for the sake of your intellect and vice versa. You don't have to sacrifice your intellect for the sake of your soul. So it was awesome that I was able to have that discussion with Kate Howell's author author of Space is Cool as F. All right, moving on through the year, I've had James Rolfe on once or twice and here's James Rolfe and I talking about all these movie remakes. What's your opinion on all these remakes and just the outright 
dig- digification of let's say oh, like yeah, Lion yeah. King making a CGI in real to lo- real life kind of stuff. But what do you think? What yeah. do you think about all that? Oh, it's funny. I, I talked to uh, someone who said the same thing. Like a lot of people are, you know, like not happy about it really at all. Mm-hmm. Uh, uh, but I never really gave much thought to it because to me they're live action, so it, it didn't really bother me. Mm-hmm. Uh, like it's it's a di- you're kind of jumping into a different medium when it turns live action. So it kind of for me it kind of justifies doing it again. But but I think still they should make it a little more different because. Um, I just saw the trailer to the, the live action Lion King, mm-hmm. and I think it's great they have James Earl Jones in the, you know, doing the voice again. Yeah, but at the same time, I'm like, he's doing the same dialogue, and it's like you might as well have just taken the same audio. It's like you didn't even change anything. Like, yeah. it, it's so similar that um, sometimes I wonder, like, why don't they change more if they're going to do a live action? Um, do something that you know that you could do in live action that you wouldn't normally do in animation so i like james's response there oftentimes when i when i give my opinion and i pose a question to somebody what they think about it i'm looking for a different opinion it's not offensive it's just different and that's kind of the spice of life is just hearing different viewpoints so james's viewpoint that he doesn't inherently have a inherent beef with remaking movies but if you're going to do a movie in a live action type of format whether that's just super hyper realistic cgi uh, 3d animation what have you do it differently don't just regurgitate you know the same dialogue basically the same storyline if you're going to do it differently if you're going to present it differently act it differently write it a little bit differently you know by nature by redoing it, you're, you're kind of taking this creative liberty to to alter it in some way. So I liked James's uh, slightly different view on that than mine. It was great talking to James. It's always great having James Rolfe, uh, a.k.a. the Angry Video Game Nerd, on Geek Therapy Radio. So, all right, in the next segment, we're going to continue on. I got kidnapped by my best man, and he kidnapped me to a Latin American country, so we're going to hear about that in the next segment. We're going to hear from David Murray, the 8-bit guy. I talked to him about his video game, uh, Planet X3. It was a great year. There's still plenty more to come here on Geek Therapy Radio. I am your mental curator, Johnny Hamburger. Stick around. More greatness to come. Uh, Subscribe to the podcast. If you're driving around right now, uh, subscribe to the podcast. Pull over and subscribe to the podcast. The podcast is, by and large, mostly new five nights a week. So Geek Therapy Radio on the Apple Podcast app, Google Podcast, however you listen to the podcast. Geek Therapy Radio. We'll be right back. Welcome back to Geek Therapy Radio. This is a year in review. I'm your mental curator, Johnny Hemberger. As mentioned in the last segment, this year I got married. But before I got married, I was kidnapped by my best man to a rather dangerous Latin American country. So this is the podcast I recorded there. A couple surfaces deep. What is that sound? Okay, let me just fast forward so people know because they're hearing ocean sounds. They're hearing speakers is behind us. Ice cream truck? I don't know. Dan, where are we? Where did you steal me from? You put a pillowcase over my head and stole me in the morning time at 6 a.m. 6 a.m. Where did we wind up? We showed up and we ended up in the nation of El Salvador. So, (laughs) (laughs) right now you hear the ocean behind us because Dan stole me in the middle of the night and took me to El Salvador. And we are a couple minutes into the show. We haven't even opened our, what are these? They're just labeled Pilsner. These are Pilsner lagers. Cerveza lager classica. No, makes no sense. But it's beer. It's beer. And they were gonna drink it. Oh, here's the bottle opener. Dan says this bottle opener, bottle opener is rusty, but it should still do the trick, so. Yeah. Let's see, let's see. Let me do it by I the microphone. I found it in the casino. Let me see it by the microphone. Oh, jeez. Dan. It's not working. What is this? What did you find here? It has no tooth on it. Okay, you you just got to get it just right. Yeah, it's got to be... There's my Pilsner. Okay, here's my Pilsner lager. I apologize if the audio quality sounds not up to quite the snuff, but listen, I was kidnapped in the middle of the night. This is just what I had on me. It was a miracle I was able to record anything, and maybe I should have just enjoyed the ocean and the time there, but I had my backpack with me, and I always have a microphone with me. So anyways, let's move on to 
a conversation I had this year with David Murray regarding developments of his video game Planet X3. I haven't really mentioned this a lot, but I actually have a guy who's working on a port for me for the uh, Sega Genesis. What? <laughs> yeah. That's awesome. Uh, I I, uh, I need to get back with him. He started work on it about a month ago, and he said he's made significant progress. I haven't actually seen anything of it yet, but uh, on the bright side, he's he's you know he's already got all the graphics um, you know available. I mean, he probably have to convert it a little bit, but. Um, so he doesn't have to redo all the graphics, but, uh, yeah, he's got to redo all the, the code, all the source code. That is, that is really, really cool. I, that's not, that didn't even cross my mind, but so are you talking maybe eventually, hopefully in the future shipping out actual, uh, cartridges? Yeah, that's the plan. Awesome. So, I'm actually awesome. really curious to see how he's going to do the interface too, because, uh, Planet X3 requires quite a few different keys on the keyboard to initiate different commands. And obviously when you're dealing with something uh, like a game console, yeah. uh, he's going to have to redo some of the interface to make it work better with uh, the controller with limited buttons. Yeah. So I'll be curious to see how he does it. So I, I have two extremely facetious requests here. One, mm-hmm. that he does a port that can completely take advantage of the 32X add-on and also make sure it's compatible with the Sonic and Knuckles. Uh, what do you call it? Sister, sister board, daughter board, whatever you want to call. It. You know what I'm talking about? Sonic and Knuckles, where you could put Sonic Two and Three on top of it, and then you could play as Knuckles inside Sonic Two and Sonic Three. If if Planet X Three can can use those two devices, the 32X and the Sonic and Knuckles cartridge, that would be awesome. But I I would be curious to his take on that. I'm being completely facetious with this, but you know, you never know. <laughs> I haven't heard him mention those, so uh, yeah, so, I don't know. See. But, uh, the, the Sonic and Knuckles thing, that's really ridiculous, but the 32X thing, I don't know, maybe you can add some extra sprites or some extra Easter eggs or extra sound. I don't know. It, it's fun. As geeks, it is very fun to kind of speculate on all this, whether or not it actually comes to fruition. Do I? Am I holding my breath for a 32X I think capable? It is safe to say, though, that he will take excellent advantage of the sound chip in the fake Genesis because yeah. the guy doing this is actually the guy who wrote the sound engine for the PC version of the game. What I love about what David's doing with Planet X3 and what he does with his dream computer and anything else he's working on, that it is so beautifully open source that his viewers, his YouTube viewers, his community on Facebook, they all come together to bring these communal dreams to reality. And I just, I freaking love that about David Murray, uh, the 8-bit guy. All right, so as I often say on Geek Therapy Radio, I can't talk to David Murray without talking to Clint from Lazy Game Reviews. And this year he visited an absolute geek heaven on earth. So let's revisit that conversation. Clint, can you tell us a little bit about what what you were most interested in the first place? Maybe not most interested. You had a computer that you were trying to uh, repair, rebuild, get some parts for, a PC Junior. Can you tell us a little bit about that computer just to bring us up to speed in a geeky way? Yeah, so one of the things that I ran across there specifically that was most interesting was a computer system that was used by Sierra Online, the game developer from the 80s and 90s. And uh, this in particular turned out to be a programming slash quality assurance type computer that was used um, by none other than Ken Williams, the lead of the company. I've just recently found out since the video, actually, Um, I've been able to confirm it with him and some other people at Sierra. And when you know, when you boot it up, it says Ken Williams, Super Junior at your service. (laughs) It's got a hard drive full of like uh, QA files and like testing logs and, you know, bug reports for various late 80s Sierra games. So that's just one one little thing that we found there that just yeah. caught my eye. And, you know, there's a ton of things just like that. I mean, the, the room that we found that in is floor to ceiling of just endless boxes of these things like that. We just happened to notice that one because it had the big Sierra logo in the box. But, I mean, the other stuff that's in there, it goes back to the mid-70s and that room alone. Oh, yeah. The big main. Uh, did you see any mainframes in there? Big, you know, giant. Truck oh, sure. sized. Oh, sure. oh yeah, and yeah. the reel to reels for all the data as well. Those themselves, if they're not completely 
destroyed by the ravages of time and, and climate. And, you know, Dallas is very hot and magnetic tape does not do well <laughs> yeah, in the heat yeah. unless you can rebake it. Recording studios will will quote unquote bake tapes to kind of re adhere the the substrate and everything like that. But that that it's just the tip of the iceberg. Those reel to reels and those mainframes are the tip of the iceberg. And the thing is, what was re- truly one of the most amazing things was that not only was it parts and other, you know, disassembled things in various states of disrepair, but brand new in box old stock. What, what do you think was some of the coolest stuff you saw brand new uh, old? What do you call it? Old stock just in the box, unopened, completely just time time capsule what were some of the coolest stuff you saw hey well relating to some of the mainframe stuff we found a whole bunch of reels of mainframe tape that had never been used they were still sealed and they looked to be in good condition we uh, took a couple of those uh just back uh, there's one of the guys that was there he actually deals with collecting mainframes and stuff and he was looking at them and they looked amazing i mean they smelled brand new they've been in there probably since the early 80s it looked like um, yeah. but yeah and, and there were pallets and pallets full of brand new computers from IBM and you know a bunch of things that had gone through separate uh, looks like wholesale deals so maybe if they weren't brand new they were at least complete pallets full of different computers from Zenith, Compaq, IBM, uh, Hewlett Packard just things that were uh, you know I mean they're full size pallets <laughs> so the some of them that are on the bottom they're probably kind of messed up by now but the ones we were pulling out from the top and the middle still looked great and a lot of people have taken some of these home uh, and you know open them up and they're still working fine you may have to replace a battery here and there but other than that you know it's <laughs> it's it's amazing you know just the pallets full of IBM stuff alone the software I mean there is a uh, uh, most of it seemed to be from the mid to late 80s and from what I've been able to tell in and uh, having uh, done some more research, it mm-hmm. looks like that uh, the owner of the place, uh, Richard, was really involved in that business of just sort of buying out used and uh, new old stock or things that didn't sell and just stuff like that from the late 80s and kind of running a business like that. I found a bunch of ads from like PC Magazine back in the day and some newspaper yeah. uh, prints and things of him just saying, look, I've got this tons of stock here at this place. If you're a company and you need these old parts, here you go. And Or if you're a company that has a bunch of legacy hardware and you just want to get rid of it, then and they were free to send it to computer reset. And he actually put in the ad, no questions asked. We will take your old hardware. So yeah. <laughs> it's just and he did. Just, yeah, he did. He took it all and no questions asked. It's always an absolute pleasure to talk to Clint. Always a pleasure to talk to David. They are quickly becoming best friends of Geek Therapy Radio. And speaking of best friends of Geek Therapy Radio, in the next segment coming up, I talked to Colin from the YouTube channel, This Does Not Compute about preservation of our current history into the future. What kind of storage media will we use? It's a very fascinating discussion that I had with him earlier this year. More Geek Therapy Radio coming up. Don't go anywhere. Welcome back to Geek Therapy Radio 2019 Year in Review. It's kind of a best of show where I'm sharing clips of my best conversations from 2019 and we're moving on to Colin from the YouTube channel This Does Not Compute. I'm super proud of Colin. I have watched his channel just explode. It's been wonderful to watch. We talked about storage medians and how we're going to preserve our current history into the future. Uh, Microsoft announced that they had this Project Silica, which is going, they claim it's going to preserve data for hundreds of years, if not thousands. And that got Colin and I onto a very fascinating discussion. So I'm just kind of wondering with this Microsoft, you know, storage method in in this glass, you sure you can say decades or centuries, but if it's like any other kind of storage median, the work is cut out for you and no one's going to be around in a thousand years to, to test it. Well, so that's really, that brings up a really interesting topic. Mm -hmm. And that is, you know, like for hundreds, thousands of years, we've had like books you know, people a long time ago. And that's how we carried historical information from then until now. Since we're moving all digital, like what's, what's going to carry that information forward? You know, like a thousand years from now, kids sitting in class or learning however it is kids learn in a thousand years, how are they going to know what life was like now if everything that we record is digital? 
Right. And so there's uh, periodically those sorts of projects like that Microsoft one will will crop up where someone gets this idea where, you know, we need a high density storage medium that's incredibly robust meant for permanent archival purposes. You know, we can Mm -hmm. we can write all of our critical data to it now and bury it in some you know, some salt mine and, you know, and in a billion years they can dig it up and still be able to read it kind Mm -hmm. of a thing. And that's all well and good. And, you know, it's probably a good idea that we should at least have some historical record like that where we can take, you know, maybe current events, take, you know, news articles and that sort of stuff. Mm -hmm. Um, more, I guess you could say like official historical kind of records of what we would want to, you know, the most important stuff of what we would want to carry forward about what life is like now and save it to some sort of medium like that. Yeah. But where my head has been at, cause you know, I'm dealing with archival data all the time cause I keep every scrap of media that I create for my YouTube channel. Mm -hmm. I never throw any of it out. There are some YouTubers who create a video and as soon as they upload it to YouTube, they just delete everything and start fresh. Mm -hmm. I keep absolutely everything. So I'm getting into the terabytes range of, of content, like, like tens of terabytes. Yeah. Um, I'm at the point where every year I have to buy a big hard drive just Mm -hmm. for that year's archive. Right. And so where my head has been going to is, you know, we don't, for the bulk of our data, we don't necessarily need a like permanent, really robust thousands of years archival media. Mm-hmm. We just need to keep rolling the data forward. Right. Mm-hmm. Right now we're mm-hmm. storing data. You know, we used to store it generally on hard drives and then it went to SSDs when hard drives were small, like you were saying, we burned it to CDs and DVDs and that sort of stuff because we went with whatever was the cheapest storage medium available, right? Best right. bang for buck. Yeah. And now people keep moving more and more out to storing it in the cloud. Well, the cloud is just a, a whole ton of hard drives, right? There's mm-hmm. nothing magic about it. Except there have been some interesting things that some companies have been doing. For example, I remember reading an article a while ago. I don't know if they still do this. But Facebook backs up its data to Blu-rays. It's got this giant like Blu-ray, like you think the CD changer from back then, you know, you could put like the hundred discs in the CD changer. Yeah. Yeah. They've got like an entire room that's just full of Blu-ray drives and changers and all this kind of stuff, I guess. Mm -hmm. But, you know, mainline or what they call nearline storage is just going to keep advancing and getting more dense and cheaper and faster as time goes on. So what I think the future is going to be is like file systems and data integrity and stuff like that. Because it's Mm. going to need to keep getting copied and copied and copied and copied over multiple generations. In the analog era, you know, if you think about something like cassettes, if you make a copy of a copy of a copy, the quality keeps going down. Right. With digital it's supposed to be perfect every time Mm -hmm. you make a copy you can have thousands of generations of a digital copy and it should still be bit perfect to the original right well that doesn't take into account like the laws of physics and the way that the hardware actually works and then errors that may occur uh, file corruption due to Mm -hmm. bugs in file systems that sort of stuff right and so i think You know, kind of what's been going on with a lot of like open source file systems or quasi open source file systems like BetterFS and ZFS is we're starting to see much better like error checking and correction built in at the file system level. Hmm. And I think that's going to be really the future going forward is how do we take this data that's already digital, that's already maybe been copied several times Right. And ensure that it doesn't get corrupted over the span of years or decades or centuries or more. Very, very fascinating to think about. We'll have books that have recorded history because books we can fairly well preserve. They are physical copies of media versus nowadays when we store everything digitally. Is there even going to be a device 10,000 years in the future 
that can read storage media from 10,000 years in the past. It's a very fascinating concept to think about. So again, my thanks to Colin for, for coming on to Geek Therapy Radio multiple times this year, and I would assume multiple times in the next year. Okay, moving on to one of the coolest interviews that I was I had the privilege of doing this year. I am a big fan of the Raspberry Pi single board computer, and I got the extreme pleasure of talking to Eben Upton. He is the founder and CEO of the Raspberry Pi Foundation. And quick little funny story, when I reached out to Raspberry for an interview, Eben is the one who actually responded to me, and I kind of kept pushing off the interview. I kind of kept like readjusting the schedule because I thought I was just talking to a a low-level representative of Raspberry Pi. Then it dawned on me, I'm talking to the creator of of the entire Raspberry Pi phenomenon. And I'm sitting there saying, oh, can we do it an hour later? Or maybe on this day, da, da, da. Ah, <laughs> I felt like such, such a boob. Anyways, here's our discussion, me and Eb- uh, Eben Upton, CEO and founder of Raspberry Pi, about the most recent model, the Raspberry Pi 4. It was just a lovely discussion. So from across the pond, here was Eben Upton, CEO and founder of Raspberry Pi. So there are yeah. really cool things. They're, they're like you said, they're more geared towards people who want to get into um, programming, but they can be as simple as a desktop operating system uh, with Raspbian that we're for the most part used to. Whether you're coming from Mac or from Windows, the user interface, you know, based on Linux, is very easy to get into. So it shouldn't be anything that scares anyone away, thinking, "Oh, I need to get this if I'm a you know a computer program or anything like that." No, you can dive in at any skill level. I would say. Would you agree with that or not? I think this is a big thing that's changed with Raspberry Pi 4, certainly. So this is the product that we launched in uh, in June, mm-hmm. um, is that we've kind of crossed, there's an invisible line uh, that separates not a PC from is a PC yeah. uh, for, 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 for your kind of average user. Uh, and uh, as we, we kind of push performance up by about a factor of three versus the previous product, this is now a product which is... we. It's now a product which is about 40 times as powerful as the first Raspberry Pi that we made back in 2012. Yes. Um, and, and somehow we've gone over this line. And so uh, the the the, uh, the thing that dramatizes it best for me is my director of software engineering has always had a Raspberry Pi on his kitchen worktop at home. Mm-hmm. Um, and the big change since he upgraded to a Raspberry Pi 4, and he used it to you know, surf the web and stuff. Yeah. And the big ch- change that's happened since uh, he switched that machine to be a Raspberry Pi 4 is when he goes home in the evening, his laptop doesn't come out of its bag. Yeah. Um, his yeah. laptop stays in the bag and he just uses the Raspberry Pi. And that's kind of, no one's forcing him to do that. You know, we don't have a policy of forcing our employees to uh, uh, to use our product. But right. it's, it's something that's something changed. And so you're right, it is as simple as, and it's intended to be, as simple as just being a PC. But we bundle it with all those tools and all the documentation that you need to just take those first little baby steps down towards being a computer program. And yes, I apologize. I took that last clip. It was from the end of one of the segments. So that's why you heard that premature bump music. Moving on. So in the last segment coming up here of Geek Therapy Radio, I'm going to play something that I am most proud of in 2019. And it is my segment dedicated to the 50th anniversary of the Apollo 11 moon landing. The first time man set foot on the moon. So coming up here in the next segment, I will not introduce the next segment in the intro. It's just going to start. It's going to play in its entirety. I'm ultra proud of it. It it gives me goosebumps when I listen to it. Hopefully it gives you goosebumps. And when you listen to it, even though I know it pales in in comparison to other documentaries and other things that have been said about the 50th anniversary of the moon landing, but it's what we celebrated in 2019. And right now, this is the Geek Therapy Radio 2019 year in review, where we celebrate all the accomplishments and where how far Geek Therapy Radio has come. Thanks to you for listening to Geek Therapy Radio. It's all because of you. More Geek Therapy Radio coming up. 50th anniversary moon landing special. Next segment, don't go anywhere. Since the first human being opened their eyes under the new weight of conscious uncertainty, they couldn't help but look to the stars in wonder. Wonder about his or her place among the brilliant points of light. Wonder about the very nature of the stars, and therefore wonder about the very nature of themselves. 
Though through the ages our default was to worship under the sheer influence of their majesty, slowly but surely our curiosity led us to conquer the ocean itself, to reach out and touch the corners of our own world. Looking up, we let heaven itself guide our course across the sea along the way discovering that we were in fact not alone on the patch of dirt from which we disembarked on the journey. The stars would guide mankind to new lands, new worlds, and new life. Inevitably, as more time would pass and more new worlds would be discovered, we would continue our gaze upward all the while asking questions of ourselves and developing new methods to test those questions. By looking upward, asking questions, and testing those questions, eventually we created the tools to look deeper into the heavens than previously conceivable and eventually ask an inconceivable question. Could we go there? In 1962, at Rice University in Houston, Texas, President John F. Kennedy would call upon an army of multinational talent of every race and every background to ensure that which made us the most powerful nation on Earth would propel mankind to the moon itself. But I do say that space can be explored and mastered without feeding the fires of war, without repeating the mistakes that man has made in extending his writ around this globe of ours. There is no strife, no prejudice, no national conflict in outer space as yet. Its hazards are hostile to us all. Its conquest deserves the best of all mankind. And its opportunity for peaceful cooperation may never come again. But why some say the moon? Why choose this as our goal? And they may well ask, why climb the highest mountain? Why 35 years ago, fly the Atlantic? Why does Rice play Texas? We choose to go to the moon. We choose to go to the moon. We choose to go to the moon in this decade and do the other thing. Not because they are easy, but because they are hard. Because that goal will serve to organize and measure the best of our energies and skills. Because that challenge is one that we're willing to accept. One we are unwilling to postpone and one we intend to win. And with that challenge, and within seven short years, three men sitting on the shoulders of giants, fueled by the desire to honor those who gave their own lives in this pursuit, would strap themselves to the most powerful machine ever created in human history and hurdled themselves violently out of Earth's grip at over 17,000 miles per hour to reach the terrifying serenity of nothingness. Neil Armstrong, Buzz Aldrin, and Michael Collins would spend the next three days in close-quartered isolation. A unique predicament to feel cramped while floating through the almost complete nothingness of outer space. Each day home growing smaller while the prize grew bigger. Apollo 11 would enter orbit around the moon about 75 hours after launch. While three days of isolation would be torment in itself, communications blackout during the portion of orbit which found the spacecraft on the opposite side of the moon must have been surreal. For about three minutes, the crew were temporarily the only living human beings to be completely cut off from their species and home altogether. No person alive or dead has been further away and more out of reach than those who have been in orbits around the moon. Mm -hmm. 
Armstrong, Aldrin, and Collins were seasoned professionals, however, enduring years of training and preparation. As the three approached the landing site in the Sea of Tranquility, the lunar module would detach from the command module, leaving Michael Collins behind to maintain lunar orbit while Armstrong and Aldrin made the final descent. Then, on July 20th, 1969, 2.17 Central Standard Time. I present. On any bite. 875 feet. That's looking good. Down a half. Six forward. 60 seconds. Ice on. Six. Down two and a half. Forward. Forward. Hit. 30 feet down, two and a half. Picking up some dust. 30 feet, two and a half down. Great shadow. Four forward. Four forward, drift into the right a little. Ready? Down and a half. 30 seconds. Forward, drift. Hit. Hey. Contact light. Okay, engine stop. Houston, uh, Tranquility Base here. The Eagle has landed. Roger, Twink. Tranquility, we copy you on the ground. You got a bunch of guys about to turn blue. We're breathing again. Thanks a lot. And then came the words... Perhaps the most famous words, famous sentence ever uttered in human history. That allowed the entire world to come together as one and forget at least temporarily our problems and be shown what we can do when we put away petty things and petty disagreements and come together to achieve something greater than ourselves. I'm gonna step off the limb now. That's one small step for man, one giant leap for mankind. I hope you've enjoyed this edition of Geek Therapy Radio and especially this last segment. My tribute to the 50th anniversary of the Apollo 11 moon landing. And I just want to leave the audience, anybody listening, anybody listening to the broadcast as it airs on the anniversary of the moon landing, anybody listening to the podcast, I want to leave you with these thoughts. My hope for the 50th anniversary of the Apollo 11 moon landing is to inspire you. I hope that we can all look to what we have achieved 50 years ago and not question and not be angry that we haven't been back to the moon or that progress seems to be slow on that front. But to remind ourselves of what we can do as a human civilization when we come together in a country that allows for such a thing to happen. We put away your differences, skin color, race, religion. Let it be a reminder of what we can do when we all team together to do something greater than ourselves. Keep looking to the stars. Stay curious. Embrace your inner geek. And I'll see you next week.